if you think that God chose America as his divine messianic force to be a sort of policeman of the whole world. God has a way of standing before the nations with judgment, and it seems that I can hear God saying to America, you are too arrogant. If you don't change your ways, I will rise up and break the backbone of your power. Habarigani. This is Sister Thaj welcoming you to the liberated zone of freedom now, a Pan-Africanist and internationalist world affairs program. Our agenda for this Saturday, February 4th, 2023. We commence with prolific author, radical historian, professor of African American studies at the University of Houston and Freedom Now co-producer, Dr. Gerald Horn, who interviews Nicholas Farrell Bloom, visiting assistant professor in the Department of History at the University of Rochester and author of the article, The Reactionary Romance of American Slave Revolt, telling the story of the 1811 German Coast Uprising in the recent edition of the American Quarterly. Then, later in the hour, Dr. Horn interviews Andrew Baer, Associate Professor of History at the University of Alabama at Birmingham, here to discuss his book, Beyond the Usual Beating, The John Burge Police Torture Scandal and Social Movements for Police Accountability. We also want to give our heartiest congratulations to Dr. Horn for being awarded the 2023 France Fanon Lifetime Achievement Award from the Caribbean Philosophical Association. Our music clip mix includes MLK, Zap Mama, John Coltrane, Hank Mobley, Cannonball Adderley, Gene Ammons, and Lou Donaldson. So sit back, phone a friend, and as always, we stand ready for revolution. Of all our studies, history is best qualified to reward all research. And when you see that you got problems, all you have to do is examine the historic method used all over the world by others who had problems similar to yours. And once you see how they got there straight, then you know how you can get yours straight. So we bring you the African Drumbeat Historical Calendar here at KPFK's Freedom Now, where every day, every week, every month, we cover African history. February 2nd, 1848, the first draft of the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo siege Mexican land to the United States. Subsequently, every provision of the agreement between defeated Mexico and the United States was violated by the United States. February 3rd, 1969, Eduardo Mundalande, founder president of Frenimo, Front for the Liberation of Mozambique was assassinated. Frenimo was a vanguard movement in the decolonization struggle against Portuguese colonialism in Mozambique. February 3, 1810, the black hero of Argentina dies, Antonio Ruiz, was a national hero of Buenos Aires, Argentina. He died in the struggle to liberate his country from colonialism. February 3, 1903, Jack Johnson becomes the first Negro heavyweight champion in the world. February 3, 1920, the Negro Baseball League is founded. February 4, 1969, MPLA. Movement for the Liberation of Angola begins armed struggle against the Portuguese colonial forces in Angola, giving rise to the overthrow not only of Portuguese colonialism in Angola, but the overthrow of the military dictatorship and the rise of a socialist government in Portugal. February 5, 1967, the Russia Declaration is ratified, which clarifies the ideology of Tanzania as socialism. February 5, 1915, Janu Gul, a South African woman freedom fighter organizes against the Colored Affairs Department of Racist South Africa. She was a co-founder of the All-African Convention in 1935. She further organized youth resistance groups throughout the South Africa in the 1940s, 50s, and 60s and was forced into exile in 1963. February 6, 1820. Africans in America emigrate back to Sierra Leone from New York to escape the ravages of slavery 
February 6, 1961. The jail in movement starts in Rock Hill, South Carolina, when students refuse to pay fines and requested jail sentences. SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, urges Southwide Jail No Bail Campaign. February 6, 1945. Bob Marley, the reggae superstar, was during a period of depoliticization of music with the corporate created disco craze brought reggae to the masses of humanity as a musical ideological weapon whose lyrical content affirmed African history, the decolonization movements, black pride, love, and unity among many things. February 7, 1926, Negro History Week is originated by Cardi G. Woodson and observed for the first time. In 1976, it becomes Black History Month. This has been Brother Dinan Kamati with the African Drum Beat Historical Calendar. This is Gerald Horn for KPFK, kpfk.org, and with me on the line is Nicholas Farrell Bloom, visiting assistant professor of history at the University of Rochester and author of the article in the current issue of American Quarterly, the Reactionary Romance of American Slave Revolt, Scripting the Unthinkable in the Archive of the 1811 German Coast Uprising. Thank you for joining us on Freedom Now, KPFK Los Angeles, Nicholas Farrell Bloom. Thank you so much, Dr. Horn. And, and let me just express what an honor it is to be here, both on this this really wonderful radio program uh, that I've had a chance to check out since I've been invited here, and also with, with you, whose work I've um, admired for many years throughout graduate school and now as an early stage um, scholar and professor. So um, I have your copy of The Apocalypse of Settler Colonialism actually right next to me because I'm teaching it in one of my classes. So, Oh, glad uh, to hear it. Glad to hear it. Yep. So for those who may not be familiar, the 1811 German Coast Uprising in Southern Louisiana was reputedly the largest revolt of the enslaved in U.S. history, involving scores, if not hundreds, of enslaved Africans. Why did you decide to write about this important episode? Well, um... It's it's a somewhat um, long and winding story as to how I got to the 1811 revolt, um, but I was initially interested in my um, graduate research in writing about. Um, I, I had in very early stages my my initial master's project had been about um, the ways that um, working class whites and some middle management whites in the U.S. South had written about um, black revolts, and I sort of was arguing that there was this um, kind of form of what they understood to be a kind of resistant ideology to the planter class that actually just ended up reproducing their own investments in anti-blackness and in the plantation system itself. Um, and it was in the course of that research that I was reading about the 1811 revolts um, and found some of the kind of earlier scholarship on the revolts um, seeming to sort of reproduce some of those similar kind of ideals. I mean, this was really early scholarship from like the 50s and 60s and, and things. And so I decided to, that I wanted to, as part of my doctoral work, go and revisit this, um, some of these same ar archives that historians had um, uh, looked at previously. Also, I was made aware of, of this reenactment that was being... Um, organized at, at the time it was happening in the future. Now it's, it's already happened in 2019 by the performance artist Dred Scott, um, in which uh, Dred Scott was organizing this, this huge kind of re reenactment and also kind of, um, I would say, public art display, community organizing event dedicated to the public memory of this revolt in, in um, the New Orleans area. Um, and so both of those things, I think, piqued my interest in it. Um, and so then I, you know, went to the, the um, St. Charles Parish Courthouse and, and checked out some of these documents. Initially, it was only supposed to be kind of a small part of my dissertation, but 
uh, I ended up just sort of um, in these documents for a much longer period of time than I thought I, I might have been and ended up writing a whole article about it. So that's, uh, there's even a little more to the story, but I'll, I'll stop there. <laughs> okay. So what was the role of Haiti in this revolt? Because we know that the Haitian Revolution comes to a successful conclusion, so to speak, by 1804. And we know that many of the enslavers flee to the North American mainland, possibly, potentially with their enslaved property so-called in tow. So what was the role of Haiti in the uprising in 1811 in Louisiana? Well, there's there's several different implications and, and um I'll probably miss some as I try to, to explain this, but I, um, I, the first is, is simply that um, the only reason that Louisiana is in the hands of the United States in 1811 is because of the Haitian Revolution. It's because of the Haitian Revolution that uh, France decides to basically um, sell its uh, the, most of its sort of um, southern, at least uh, American colonies, and obviously what most listeners are going to know is the Louisiana Purchase. Um, it's because of the Haitian Revolution that um, lots of uh, Creole slave-owning whites are moving from what was San Domingue, which is now Haiti, to Louisiana. Um, and so that's that's one sort of uh, implication. Another is that there was sort of, uh, because of this transition from France to the United States, there was a lot of instability um, in this region at this moment. Um, it was unclear to both the kind of new Anglo-American elites and government that was moving in and the French career elites, how um, the new government was going to work there. Um, and the um, African-Americans, enslaved and free living in this um, at Louisiana at this moment, were trying to figure out um, how to, um, I think, live best in the context of, of these changing, shifting regimes. Um, it also presented an opportunity um, it's, it's probably not a coincidence that at this moment, in this moment of kind of instability, is when the 1811 revolutionaries decide to, well, it was probably starting a little earlier, to make their stand, to organize, to take advantage of a generally unstable situation among the white elites in the region. Um, there's been some scholarly debate about whether or not the revolutionaries themselves were from Haiti. Um, it seems... The, the person who's generally credited with leading the revolt, Charles de Londe, although I, um, I think sometimes he, he, he was often uh, labeled as the person who was the, the so-called chief, is what the, um, the elites in the area referred to him as. But he was also of the leaders. He was certainly one of the leaders. He was the one they identified as the person with the lightest skin. So they decided he must have been the leader. So I, I'm not entirely sure that he was the only leader. In any case, there was... A lot of thought um, initially among scholars that he might have been from Haiti, but uh, more recently, I know Albert Thrasher, the um, historian from Louisiana, I think argued that this probably wasn't the case. There's there's um, birth records that suggest that he was born in the United States, but that would be another implication um, of Haiti because regardless, the um, uh, African Americans living in Louisiana would have been completely aware of the Haitian Revolution of the possibility of something like Haiti happening in Louisiana. Um, and so undoubtedly the Haitian Revolution um, acted at the very least as inspiration for the 1811 um, revolutionaries, if not uh, literally, the you know, whether or not there were literally people there who were participating in it who had been in Haiti before. Now turning the coin over, uh, what insight does Thomas Jefferson, the third U.S. president, a man who is thought to embody the United States as a whole, what insight does he provide in your telling? Well, I, I focus on Thomas Jefferson because um, he is somebody who, of the American so-called founders, is um, the most preoccupied with talking about slave revolt, both as a metaphor for... Um, what they were trying to do uh, in, in becoming their own country that was constantly used as a metaphor for rebelling against the tyranny and so-called slavery of um, British colonial governance, but also with the um, revolutionary pos potentials embodied by the large numbers of enslaved Africans, of course, which um, 
literally living on the properties and as legal property of Thomas Jefferson himself. Um, and, and so what's interesting to me about Thomas Jefferson, what, what I sort of, the reason I, I focus on the 1811 revolt in general here is because it's at this place that's tenuously part of the United States at this moment. Um, but it's sort of, I think, through a national narrative that Thomas Jefferson is not solely and maybe not even primarily, but perhaps most vocally and most memorably um, responsible for creating. It's through a kind of joining of forces among these French Creoles and Anglo-Americans um, via this kind of narrative that I describe as the reactionary romance um, that a kind of alliance among these pro-slavery elites is formed in 1811. So um, I use Thomas Jefferson's writings, and I think we'll get a little more into the specifics of, of what I um, use from him in a second, but I use Thomas Jefferson's writings as sort of the uh, paradigmatic example of these uh, this Anglo-American national um, narrative kind of uh, teleology uh, that I describe as the reactionary romance of American slave revolt. Along that line, on page 851, you write, quote, this last aspect of Jefferson's national romantic narrative, the implication that the white American revolutionaries are acting against Britain in order to stave off the existential black threat from the inside is what renders it a reactionary romance. And the sentence above that you write, per Jefferson, quote, white Americans are rebelling in order to prevent enslaved black Americans from rebelling in 1776, presumably. What are the implications of those explosive words? And perhaps you could weave in as well your reference to the scholarship of the contemporary academic Robert Parkinson. Right. Well, so, um, and I think here I'm, I'm in particular referring to a, um, a passage from a, a deleted clause from the Declaration of Independence that Jefferson initially had put in in a rough draft that was then taken out, um, and which is involved in the the um, article in which he says that King George, and this is a so a justification for the revolution. King George has waged cruel war against human nature itself, violating its most sacred rights of life and liberty in the persons of distant people who have never offended him captivating and carrying them into slavery into another hemisphere. So you think, okay, great, Thomas Jefferson is um, condemning slavery in the slave trade. And, but then he writes, and he is now exciting those very people to rise in arms among us and to purchase that liberty of which he has deprived them by murdering the people on whom he has obtruded them. So it's this really fascinating and I think pretty sinister <laughs> logic that Jefferson is using here because he's saying he's blaming um Britain and King George, which of course, until two days before he wrote this, he was a part of this same entity, um, for slavery. He's not taking any responsibility. He and his fellow Anglo elites or, or Anglo American elites are taking no responsibility for slavery themselves. And they're arguing that one of the key reasons that they need to separate from England and from Great Britain and the, and the crown is that um, allegedly King George is trying to start slave revolts in the United States. And so that is, and, 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 and not just start slave revolts, he's saying he's trying to um, murder the people, so murder people like Jefferson on whom he has obtruded them. So, you know, I don't think it's a, you know, I I'm, um, appreciate that perhaps for many people reading it, it, they might find, you know, my kind of paraphrase of this is an explosive reading, but I, I don't find it particularly controversial. I mean, he's literally saying, um, in that sentence that the reason why Americans need to start their own country is to prevent black Americans from rebelling and murdering them. I mean, that's, that's very explicitly his, his logic there. Um, and that ends up getting included in the final draft in a much sort of tamer form when he says that um, uh, King George is trying to uh, start, quote, domestic insurrections among us. But everyone would have understood that to mean um, slave revolts. He also says in that same patch, it's bring about the merciless Indian savages. So that's, so those are 
And those are the that's the the ultimate line in the in the declaration for why the United States needs to become a country is to suppress black revolt and quell the quote unquote merciless Indian savages. Um, so in terms of the scholarship of Robert Parkinson, I, I will say that the reason that I initially went to Robert Parkinson is that a um, uh, a reviewer of this uh, initial peer or er, um, reviewer for American Quarterly said you need to go check out the scholarship of Robert, Robert Parkinson. But um, when I did, I think what I found particularly useful about his scholarship is that he marshals uh, an amazing amount of primary evidence uh, across a vast array of um, from newspapers to state documents to letters to suggest that one of the ways that the United States um, elites or what would become the United States elites um, uh, kind of marshaled a cross-class, cross-region um, white support for the uh, the revolution was by associating the British crown with um, racial others, racial so-called enemies that they would have already understood to be enemy forces, such as potentially rebellious slaves and ind indigenous people. And that it was by yoking um, the British army and the British crown to these racial others that the American elites were able to marshal support among uh, masses of um, white settler North Americans um, in favor of the revolution. Um, so that's that's most basically why I found Parkinson's uh, scholarship useful. And I'm sure our audience does not have to be instructed on what are the implications of a nation being constructed on the basis of anti-blackness and anti-indigenous sentiment. In any case, on page 854, you suggest that when enslavers and their representatives wrote about this uprising of the enslaved in Louisiana in 1811, they wrote fiction. Mm. Uh, what do you mean by that? Well, and, and here I'm borrowing from another scholar, a scholar um, who maybe some of your listeners are familiar with named Sadia Hartman. And she um, in makes the argument that um, I mean, and much of her work is dedicated to thinking about the ways that archives really, um, and our archives of especially black life in the United States um, have done a lot to really silence and um, uh, distort um, historians' visions of what African-American life uh, would have been like under slavery and, and afterwards as well. Um, and so that, I, I believe, if, no, I could be getting this wrong. I believe that line comes from an article called um, Venus in Two Acts in which she basically writes that um, all these kind of various um, descriptions of enslaved African Americans tend to always fit into particular types um, that in the end all kind of do the same thing, which is that instead of looking at these uh, people as people or as individuals or as uh, people as part of complex social networks or anything like this, um, people writing these archives who usually had a particular investment in con con continuing to keep these people enslaved um, in some fashion or another, or at least oppressed, um, whatever kind of record they were making of this person was in the service of that violation, of that enslavement. Um, and so it's therefore really hard to to trust the uh, records that we have um, about the motivations of, uh, really about the lives of any African Americans in this point coming from you know the state or the the planter class, but in particular this is true. Um, what I argue in 1811 or for any slave revolt because. Um, in many ways, the state and the militia and the armies in this moment are primarily devoted to maintaining the integrity of the plantation system. And so it is really hard to trust any kind of court, legal, um, or even journalistic account of this revolt um, because basically 100% of these accounts are written by people who would have been um, actively engaged in trying to suppress that revolt. On page 862, you write that free men of color helped to suppress this revolt, one of the reasons why it did not succeed. 
Talk to us about that and what are or what were the implications of that? Well, it's a bit, it's, um, this is a, you know, a complex issue. I think that there would, there were a, a substantial number of free people of color living in Louisiana in 1811. Um, some of whom would have owned property, a few of whom may have, you know, would have even owned slaves. Um, and there was a militia and, and because of the really mass, you know, like the large black population in Louisiana at this moment, it was impossible really for the French Creole elites who had been, and then before that Spanish and now American, it was a very complex kind of imperial situation going on there. Um, it was really impossible for the settler white elites living in this area to not get some buy-in from this um, uh, substantial population of free people of color. And as a result, there had been a long-standing militia uh, made up of um, free people of color in Louisiana. There's a good article about this by a historian named James Wainwright, if anyone wants to check that out. But um, in any case, this uh, militia was certainly involved in helping to put down the revolt. Um, but I think that it can be overstated the extent to which um, the, these people really would have, um, in the end, benefited from this plantation system. So literally at this, uh, in the same year, and maybe even at the same moment that um, uh, Governor Claiborne, who was the, the new American governor of Louisiana, um, or the territory of Orleans is what it was at the time, literally the same moment that he is arming free people of color, um, even sometimes writing letters in praise of free people of color or enslaved black people who helped to put down the revolt. He's also writing letters to various Caribbean authorities uh, saying, please stop sending free people of color here. We don't want any more people of that description here. Um, and one of his major initiatives as governor is in fact trying to uh, tamp down the number of free people of color who are allowed into the region and trying to expel free people of color as much as possible. And also he initially tries to just get rid of the militia um, and finds he's sort of unable to do that. But um, I think there's my ultimate um, argument about, you know, how to kind of the, the implications of, of this group of people at this moment is that um, this same reactionary romance that would have had, I think, its most powerful cohering effects among white settlers. Um, I think it's we shouldn't underestimate the fact that it would have also had an effect, both not just the narrative, but the material reality for for um, free uh, people of color and, and black folks as well. There also were, it seems, perhaps uh, indigenous people and so-called trackers who were paid by white settlers to go and find Charles DeLand at one point, although I think records sort of disagree about this. But, you know, in the context of this social, you know, milieu, um, I think that the free people of color understood that it was a sort of zero-sum game that you either needed to, um, especially as a black person, you, it, it was, you either needed to join the ranks of these, of this kind of burgeoning plantation system happening in, in Louisiana, which involved being involved in, you know, anti-black brutality as a kind of matter of fact, um, or you were at risk of suffering from it. Um, and you could have also been, you know, thrown in your lot with the um, Charles Delon and the 1811 rebels, but that was, I think, a much harder and <laughs> braver um, choice to make, but a very difficult choice to make. So I think that the free people of color there were in a very, very difficult situation. Um, and I think the implications of that going forward are simply that I think it helps us just to think about, um, A, how extraordinarily brave the rebels in 1811 were, that they, you know, were faced with very similar dilemmas and yet chose to rebel. Um, and B, that, um, yeah, I mean, I think that's, that's honestly, that's my main takeaway from and sort of the implications of, of uh, thinking that even these free people of color who would have been very marginalized, violated themselves, still ended up, um, you know, throwing in their, their lot with the enslavers at this moment. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm afraid we're going to have to leave it there. Nicholas Farrell Bloom, visiting assistant professor of history at the University of Rochester in New York State.
author of the article in the current American Quarterly, The Reactionary Romance of American Slave Revolt, Scripting the Unthinkable in the Archive of the 1811 German Coast Uprising. Thank you for joining us on Freedom Now, KPFK, Los Angeles. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Horn. It was really a, an honor to be here. An honor to have you. This is Gerald Horn for KPFK, kpfk.org. And with me on the line is Andrew Baer, Associate Professor of History at the University of Alabama in Birmingham and author of the book, Beyond the Usual Beating, The John Burge Police Torture Scandal and Social Movements for Police Accountability in Chicago. Thank you for joining us on Freedom Now, KPFK Los Angeles, Professor Bear. Thank you. It's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. And thank you for joining us. So who was John Burge and why did you decide to write a book with him at the center? Sure. So John Burge was a police officer. He was a detective in Chicago from 1970 to 1991. He was born on the south side of Chicago in a lily white community just after World War II. He grew up in neighborhoods that resisted so-called black resistance. Uh, he grew up near the infamous Trumbull Park um, public housing projects in Chicago that suffered years and years of viol anti-black violence at the hands of white residents. He went to public schools that resisted uh, the integration or desegregation in the south side of Chicago. He was a Vietnam War veteran. He was a military policeman in Vietnam in 68 and 69. And then he was a police officer in Chicago and he was a detective and he rose quickly through the ranks and he was very effective at his job. Um, and he oversaw dozens and dozens of other detectives. And for those 20 years, he uh, orchestrated what I think we might call now a, a torture ring, meaning a, a group of eventually dozens of detectives who coerced confessions illegally from mostly black criminal suspects, mostly in high profile felony cases, murders and arsons and sexual assaults. And this led to a huge scandal in Chicago that uh, erupted in the 1990s when news of this uh, torture scandal hit the front pages. Um, Burge then was uh, surprisingly and just sh uh, shockingly, I would say, fired from the police department. It's something that doesn't happen a lot in Chicago. Um, it led to a, an ongoing social movement that attempted to win justice and relief for dozens of torture survivors and their families. And it cost the city of Chicago millions of dollars. It led to Burge's eventual conviction and imprisonment. It led to the governor of Illinois putting a moratorium on the death penalty. It led to um, the, the end of the death penalty in the state of Illinois. It led to uh, passage of a reparations ordinance in Chicago in 2015. And many, many other things that I go into detail in, in the book. And I center Burge in part in, because um, this, the, the media narrative revolved around Burge. And I think it, it, it's complicated because it is a little bit problematic to make Burge the center of this story because it plays into the police narrative that this was a rogue cop, a bad apple, um, when really it was a systemic uh, episode where we see how racism worked within institutions. And so it, it was about more than John Burge, but I think as a historian and as a narrative storyteller, I think putting Burge at the center provided me an opportunity to put a face and a name and a narrative skeleton to this large story. Um, but whether or not Burge deserves to be in the title of the book or at the center of the narrative of the first half of the book, I think is still open to debate. And it's a decision that I made um, with some hesitation. Now, remind us again, how many victims of torture were there in Chicago during this period from the 1970s to the 1990s? Were they all young Black men? And without being overly graphic, could you describe some of the tortures? Sure. So it's a critical question. How many were tortured? And that's the kinds of question that administrators and lawyers and judges and journalists and academics all want to know. But of course, it's virtually impossible to have any sense of how many people were tor tortured. And when I say torture, I really think I'm, I, I slip a bit in the book between what I describe as police torture, which we typically think of as like the old school third degree. This is uh, police intimidation and violence used in custody, like in interrogation rooms, pursuant of statements like confessions that then could be used in court to, or, um, to convict someone. And so we think of police torture, we think of the third degree, but really the better term is coercion, coercion 
these are coerced confessions, which don't always rise to the level of what you or I or average person on the street might think of as torture, but certainly falls under the rubric of illegal acts of torture as defined by, say, the United Nations or other, you know, big national, international uh, legal bodies. So to me, it's torture. Uh, but really, how many people had confessions coerced out of them by the Chicago police between, I say, 1970 and 1995? Um, it, it would be, it's an unknowable number, likely in the thousands. Um, it, the, the numbers that have revolved around the John Birch police torture scandal, those known and documented incidents of coerced confessions that are tied to Burge and his men that worked under him, probably between about 100 and 200. Uh, but other bodies that have been tasked with locating and counting have found hundreds and hundreds more. Um, and it's really difficult to determine who qualifies as a victim of the Burge scandal and who doesn't, because really we need someone who was tortured between 1972 and in 1991, when Burge was on the force, we need to have them to have been tortured at the South Side Area 2 uh, police jurisdiction in Chicago or on the West Side when Burge traveled over there, uh, relocated. Um, so anyone who was tortured, uh, not connected to Burge, not, you know, after 1970 or not uh, before 1991, who was tortured elsewhere in the city, they often don't kind of qualify as a Burge victim, which actually does matter. Uh, in all kinds of concrete ways, because eventually people are trying to win reparations or judicial relief to get new hearings in their trials. And if they can't claim that they were tortured under Burge or his men in Chicago on the South Side between 1972 and 1991, then they may not qualify. So this is a long winded answer, but it's a virtually unknowable number. Um, it's uh, easily documented within the 100 to 200 range, but um, there are uh, scores and scores of other allegations that are contested. Um, in terms of what did the torture look like? Well, it looked like coercing confessions uh, through promises, through intimidation and threats, uh, petty violence like kicking someone in the shins or uh, forced stress positions that you might be familiar with in the global war on terror, something like what we saw in Abu Ghraib prison in 2004, um, but also more severe acts, uh, including electric shock torture, John Burge was a military policeman. He brought this technology back from Vietnam with him where he attached wires from a military style field telephone and attached those wires to uh, criminal suspects' bodies, their ears, their nose, their uh, genitals and cranked this box and gave them electric shocks. And they also used mock execution, Russian roulette, uh, suffocating people with plastic bags, um, exacerbating pre-existing injuries, threatening people um, with violence later or threatening their family members or loved ones with incarceration or arrest or violence or et cetera. So um, it was really that electroshock torture that really grabbed the headlines and caused, caused the city to realize that what they were looking at was something to quote from my title of my book and from an official investigation from Chicago police in 1990, they said it went beyond what they saw as that usual beating that they were seeing normally. But this electroshock torture, torture really um, drew the ire of communities and activists and kind of it blew up this story bigger than it would have otherwise. And in terms of the demographics of the torture victims, they are uh, overwhelmingly young African-American men, uh, who, many of them who might have had, according to the police anyway, some sort of gang affiliation, some connection to a serious crime or criminal backgrounds. These were people that the Chicago police particularly Burge and his men felt they didn't have much standing in society, that they could be leaned into and, and intimidated and threatened and attacked and physically hurt in order to solve serious felonies because much of Chicago would not care really what happened to these people. They didn't have high standings. They didn't have much credibility. Um, the police were able to abuse them with impunity. But there were also some uh, Latino uh, torture survivors. There's a few cases of white men who accused the police of uh, coercing confessions, including under Burge and with severe acts of violence. Um, and there are even some cases of, of women, um, mostly black women who accused. These are women who had some relationship to a criminal suspect. So they were a romantic partner, a sister, a mother. Uh, I've never, I had not seen a case of a daughter, but I'm thinking of a, a wife comes to mind of a man who was accused of murder. Uh, the police brought him in and coerced his confession, but also brought his wife in and threatened her and attacked her. And she filed official complaints. So mostly black men, but really we're talking about hundreds and hundreds of people. So there are all these little um, unusual cases that are illuminating as well. Now, what about the social movements that protested? Uh, give us a snapshot 
of what they look like organizationally and demographically? Well, it's super rich, it's super compelling and exciting to study these people. And it's hard to characterize them, hard to generalize. We're talking about people in Chicago in the 1980s when the torture scandal came to light, who had been working for police accountability for decades, really. I mean, by the 1980s, you're talking about uh, people that are anywhere from their 20s to their 50s and 60s who have been involved in community activism in Chicago going back at least to the 1960s, not earlier. There are direct routes to that late 60s radical moment connected to Fred Hampton and the Illinois chapter of the Black Panthers and other groups that were related to the Panther chapter of that rainbow coalition of the young patriots and the young lords and all their supporters and backers and lawyers and academics that were also involved. So really hard to care to uh, you know, describe these people in the late 80s that, that leapt in in, um, in support of the Burge torture victims. But I think it's important to highlight that it was really the Burge torture survivors themselves and their family members, particularly mothers. And I see parallels with the Scottsboro Boys of the 1930s, and they drew those connections themselves in their literature, saying we're like the Scottsboro Boys. We're bringing the parents of these men who are falsely accused, wrongfully convicted, languishing on death row, facing death, and we're bringing their parents out to put them on uh, the front of the stage as we rally. And we're seeing this sort of coalition of white, new left or leftists, uh, people connected to the whether underground, SDS and the Panthers, but now kind of in a later moment, now it's the 1980s, but they're experienced, they're veterans, they've established these organizations like the People's Law Office, which is a, a first sort of a radical left law firm that still exists in Chicago today, but become a little bit more kind of straight laced, although I guess I shouldn't use that term, but um, a little more conventional by the 1980s, but they're a civil rights firm that is uh, suing the city on behalf of survivors, g gathering information in the discovery phase of trials, releasing that information to journalists. Uh, the journalists involved include kind of the mainstream corporate press that work at the Chicago Tribune or the Sun-Times or the Defender, but also at the independent weekly, the Chicago Reader. Uh, John Conroy, a journalist for them, gets a lot of information out to the public. Um, we're looking at um, civil rights groups, people working for uh, like the the League of Independent Voters. We're looking at uh, what they used to call in Chicago um, lakefront liberals. Uh, people, some of them lived in kind of the swanky North Shore suburbs of Chicago, including Mary Powers, who was one of the founders and organizers of a group called uh, Citizens Alert. Um, and this was a police watchdog group in Chicago that was founded in the late 60s and survived all the way until about 2012 or so. Um, and so these different shifting groups and individuals from 1989 all the way to the present are coming and going, rising and falling in sort of leadership and uh you know what kind of profile they have um and it is multiracial it's multi-ethnic it's multi-generational um again very difficult to characterize but these are the same types of activists who are present in chicago in the 2010s you know looking for justice in the death of laquan mcdonald it's claiming victory at the collapse of the death penalty in illinois and burge and the burge scandal and the anti-torture movement in chicago was just one of an ongoing series of parallel movements uh, that overlapped um, and won a stunning series of victories in all different realms of policing and criminal justice in Chicago. Although I think we could look at this as a half glass half full, glass half empty sort of enterprise. Uh, on one hand, these movements accomplish a great deal. On the other hand, Illinois remains the torture capital of America, the wrongful conviction capital of America, police violence and uh, open institutional and Personal racism is still embedded in Chicago's police department and Cook County criminal justice system and on and on. But um, really, I think an exciting, rich group of activists who deserve kind of more attention by activists, or excuse me, by historians. But, but I do think there is a lot of work being done on them. Were there unions organizationally involved in the accountability movement? You know, I struggled because I can't recall locating unions uh, and their leaders being present at these rallies um showing up in the documents of like the citizens alert papers of the illinois coalition against the death penalty or the campaign to end the death penalty i'm not seeing union leadership or, or um activism being done on behalf of unions or under a union letterhead but i imagine that there are union workers and some blue-collar employees 
who are unionized and activists um, involved in these struggles and at these campaign rallies. Um, but to my knowledge, I haven't seen an explicit sort of open union presence, but I don't want to rule it out. I think if I had that question in mind, I might have been looking more for that in the documents. It didn't leap off the page. Um, I would love to see people do more work on that. But as of now, I can't recall seeing much of a union presence in that movement in the 1980s and 90s and 2000s in Chicago. But that might also reflect, you know, larger trends of, um, you know, anti-union busting in the city and the deindustrialization and the declining numbers of union members in the city of Chicago. Um, but yeah, I think that's a question that might need further research. Now, what about what happens in the courtroom? Talk to us about whether or not the victims were able to receive monetary damages and also how many people were released from prison as a result of these revelations. Sure. So unfortunately, I'm not a much of a quantitative guy. I don't have the numbers off the top of my head. Um, but there are dozens of men who receive judicial relief, including some who are released from prison, who are given new trials, who might have had their charges dropped. Who, so in other words, like their cases were dismissed and they were free to go. There were others who were just all outright exonerated, given pardons, given um, commuted sentences or um, even certificates of innocence. So that it's a long, complicated story that it's hard to kind of come up with these lists because it's so convoluted and messy. But we have um, dozens and dozens of documented cases of men who were imprisoned based on confessions coerced under John Burge and then later won their freedom. Now, not all of those people were able to claim innocence or officially kind of document innocence because in many ways, the uh, Cook County or the city of Chicago or the state of Illinois would let these people go, but without acknowledging kind of official wrongdoing. Um, and so it's a little tricky to determine as one observer whether or not someone was innocent or not. Regardless, even those who may have been guilty of a crime didn't deserve the torture that they received. And so I believe deserve some sort of judicial relief or even outright freedom. And so uh, it also a lot of these men sued um, in civil courts. Uh, some of them did it pro bono or sorry, uh, sort of a, a pro se, like on their own without getting lawyers. Others tapped into the growing experience of that people's law office that regularly sued on behalf of Burge torture victims. And they received settlements out of court, uh, first in the tunes of the thousands and the tens of thousands, eventually in the millions. And so the city of Chicago has paid upwards of, you know, 100, 200 million. There are documented lists of these numbers. I'm sorry, I don't have them on hand, but the city of Chicago paid hundreds of millions of dollars in settlements, in um, other kind of reparations along the way. As I said earlier in 2015, the Chicago City Council passed a reparations ordinance, which gave uh, between 60 and 70 torture victims uh, $100,000 checks, uh, which is really kind of a minuscule amount. You can blow through $100,000 relatively quickly, but they were also given official apologies and recognition of what happened. There was an um, impetus to create a public memorial in Chicago, which has yet to happen, but the fight uh, for um, implementing that continues. There was uh, free tuition at City College for torture survivors, their children and grandchildren. There's uh, a, a Chicago Torture, torture Justice Center uh, built on the South Side to provide services to torture survivors and vocational training and psychological counseling and on and on. So um, that's just a, a bit of what kind of came from this. And so um, many, many people were able to access the courts or settle in some other fashion um, on, because of all the works of these lawyers and activists who really believed that, uh, barring a tradition that, again, goes all the way back to Scottsboro uh, or before, of uh, this combining uh, direct action with litigation, fighting in the courts, but also fighting outside in the streets. Mm -hmm. Now, I inferred from what you said a moment or two ago that this problem continues, which leads me to ask, is it fair to say that there might be a very deep culture of torture and wrongdoing in the Chicago Police Department? Oh, absolutely. I, I feel comfortable saying that unequivocally. The Chicago Police Department was founded as a tool of racial and social class control. Um, this is an institution that was designed to maintain kind of white power, to um, keep black communities and other working poor communities down. Uh, there has been a long tradition of uh, white officers and black officers and uh, abusing black people in the Chicago uh, Police Department with impunity. Um, this is a culture of social and racial control that was at, at the core of the institution of the Chicago Police uh, 
um, has never left it, and I don't really believe ever could. Hmm. Given that, have you detected parallels in other police departments? For example, the notorious Los Angeles Police Department, to cite one example amongst many. Absolutely. You know, part of my research for this book, which began as my dissertation, involved looking at similar, and I use the word scandal kind of cautiously, but similar scandals or high profile moments of police violence or police corruption in other cities. So I was looking in LA and New York and Philadelphia and wherever I could find them. And there were other cases in big cities where we saw the use of electroshock. And electroshock probably is the what's at the kind of foreground of what made the Burge scandal so unique. But there are cases of electroshock torture in American prisons and American jails and police departments. Um, so it's not entirely unique. Um, but the kinds of things that Burge did, kind of walking up to and stopping at electroshock torture, was really more the norm of how detectives won cases and cleared you know, their files throughout this period. And I would say in some ways, all the way up to the present day. So much of the toolkit of Burge and his men, the intimidation, the coercion, the false promises, the petty violence. And I say petty, you know, maybe that's the wrong way to put it. But, you know, if you're in an interrogation room and you get slapped in the face or kicked in the shins, I mean, we might call that petty violence because it doesn't hurt that much. It might not leave a mark. But if you're chained to a table and someone's kicking you in the shins, it's quite horrific. And so um, so that's why, I mean, I, I, I'm cautious to call it petty. But I mean, those types of things were more the norm. And of course, all kinds of um, psychological techniques that were not illegal were part of the Inbow and Reed uh, method, methodology of police interrogation that has hardly changed to this day. Now, now we get more um, recording, like film, video recording of interrogations and confessions. Um, but the cameras aren't always on. Um, and so um, I think what we saw in Chicago under Burge was more representative of policing, of interrogations, of detective work in a big cities in America in the 1970s and 80s. Again, more representative than it was aberrational, although perhaps some of that electroshock with a military style field telephone is where the Burge crew went a little too far. And that's why it drew so much attention and has cost the city so much money. And of course, cost Burge his job and eventually his freedom. What about trying to dig deeper in terms of the cause and the roots of the scandal? I mean, obviously, racism is involved. White supremacy is involved. You used the term social control a moment or two ago. But what about as a legacy of slavery, a legacy of Jim Crow, a legacy of revolt by black people against both of these horrific institutions? Absolutely. You know, I mean, I think... Uh... Professor Horn, you'd agree as a, as a professor of history who you know, teaches these large swaths of time in our courses and, and also does do research and write you know, beyond just like the 1970s or whatever. I think we're conditioned to draw these deep connections. And I, and I, I take it for granted that uh, almost like, of course, slavery was a, a central component. The legacy of slavery was a central component to the outcome in the Burge scandal. Now, it's a little harder for me, um, you know, in a short amount of time to draw that connection kind of mm -hmm. in an articulate, explicit way. Um, but, you know, the history of subjugation, of white supremacy, of mass anti-black violence, of enslavement, of um, Jim Crow, segregation, I mean, all these things are at play in what, what becomes the Burge scandal in 1970s and 80s Chicago, you know. Well, again, it's such a deep, long, complicated history, but I think many of your listeners will be familiar with it. But of course, from the great migration that brings African-Americans in large numbers to places like Chicago in the 19 teens and 20s and 40s and 50s and 60s, and then the systems in place in Chicago that funnel black migrants to certain parts of the city and kind of kept them constrained and uh, not only physically and kind of residentially, but constrain their opportunities financially and occupationally and all kinds of things. You know, this created an atmosphere in 1972 where there were different demographic sets of actors. There are these deep histories that are funneling a man like John Burge, a working class white man on the south side of Chicago, funnels him into Vietnam and then into the Chicago Police Department and then might funnel an, uh, um, an African-American teenager who grows up in a public housing high rise in Chicago into uh, an illicit drug trade or a, 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 an organized street crime. And then they encounter Burge in these interrogation rooms. And when Burge is encountering these young black men in those rooms, and whether it's 1975 or 1985, you know, there's this 
long kind of tidal wave of history that has pushed these two people together at that moment on different sides of this interrogation room. One chained to a table, the other standing over them with, you know, a gun for Russian roulette or electric shock torture device or something. And I really think it'd be impossible to understand why these two people came to be at this place, at these opposite sides of this uh, performance without understanding something that goes back to 1619 or 1492 or wherever we'd like to begin. Um, uh, But I think it's impossible to explicate the legacies of slavery and Jim Crow and American white supremacy and racism from what happened in Chicago uh, and its aftermath. So finally, Professor Baer, author of the book Beyond the Usual Beating, the John Byrd's Police Torture Scandal and Social Movements for Police Accountability in Chicago. What next for Professor Baer? What do your readers have to look forward to? Sure, well, I'm humbled that you'd even ask. Uh, so I'm currently trying to get a little bit more momentum on what is a second book project. It should take, you know, several years. As you know, these books from an academic standing are, um, you know, not always meant for this mass consumption. And, you know, um, although I say that, I'm speaking to Gerald Horn, who's such a great, amazing, prolific writer. Um, and But this next project I'm working on is um, an exploration of a series of murders in Boston in 1979. Somewhere we see it kind of colloquially now referred to as the Roxbury murders, although I, I kind of want to reject that label. But basically this is, 13 women, 12 of them uh, African-American. I really think they're women and girls because some of them are as young as 15 who were murdered between January and May of 1979. And often where we see the uh, explication of this, these murders, it comes in the context of black feminism and the group known as the Combahee River Collective who, mm-hmm. who, uh, who or saw this opportunity in the spring of 1979 to kind of leave their patterns of um, of, of speaking and meeting and going to retreats and publishing and writing and taking a little bit more of an activist role in the streets to protest the murders of these black women and girls, the um, violation of their reputation by the local media who tend to dismiss their deaths, uh, suggesting that they were prostitutes, women almost in no cases, is there any evidence whatsoever that they were, Uh, they're protesting the lack of attention by the police. And they're trying to show Boston that even though there was no son of Sam style serial killer in Boston in 1979, killing black women. There was a serial killer in a sense, because it was all these overlapping intersecting oppressions that were making black women and girls vulnerable to premature death in Boston in 1979. And while there's been a lot of work on the Combahee River Collective, and even in their um, efforts to win justice in these murders, um, I find that there hasn't been a lot said about the women and the girls themselves. So my effort here is to try to um, provide a platform where these women and their family members can give a little bit more voice to them and to put a little bit more kind of humanity around the lives of these women and girls so that they are known beyond just the moments of their death. And we can kind of understand the different uh, trajectories that these women's and girls' lives kind of all unfolded in that led them to these kind of horrific moment of violence. Um, and I hope, much like the Burge book, to use this narrative skeleton of this one incident or these series of incidents in 1979 Boston to tell much larger stories about race, policing, and social movements. And now with my second book, uh, more focused on gender and sexuality as well, uh, that help us understand, you know, America in the 1970s and 80s. Well, I'm sure you'll find many readers in our audience for that book when it is published. Professor Bear, author of the book Beyond the Usual Beating, I'm afraid we're going to have to leave it there. Thank you for joining us on Freedom Now, KPFK, Los Angeles. Thank you. And in closing, we'd like to thank our guests. Thank you to our producers, Dr. Gerald Horn. Signing off for this week, this is Sister Thage. And until next week, as always, we stand ready for revolution.